And for those of you who are watching online, uh, thank you for joining us for this time. And uh, I would encourage you right now, just text a friend and say, hey, my pastor's getting ready to speak. Why don't you watch the message with me? I am so excited about this series. We are digging in to part four of our series, Where Do We Go From Here? I do want you to know that I'm leaning very strongly into Dr. David Jeremiah's teaching from his book, Where Do We Go From Here? And I would encourage you to get it and read along. We're using it as a basis for this series and the scripture that is found in each one of these chapters is a basis for what we're talking about each Sunday. In the last two years, I have been asked a lot of questions about this pandemic. Questions like, is COVID-19 a sign of the times? Has God allowed this pandemic to let people know that the end is possibly near? And does God's word say anything about this pandemic? These are questions that are important for us to ask because they cause us to dig into prophecy. Do I have this too close? I don't want to do this all Sunday. I'm just going to put it clear down here, okay? I know it's not going to look nice, but I don't like that. That's going to drive me nuts. That's all I'm going to think about, how my voice sounds weird, okay? So just say, it's okay, Harv. It's okay, Harv. Whew, there, I feel better. <laughs> the reason why we're digging into prophecy is while God's word doesn't use the word pandemic because it's a modern word, Church, the Bible does use several words that mean the same thing. Words like pestilence. Pestilence means a contagious, infectious epidemic or disease. The Bible also uses words like plague and disease along with a few other words. And these words that are used to describe pandemic, get this church, are used 127 times in the Bible. So, God's word has a lot to say about pandemics. And there are several examples of God using epidemics or pandemics to accomplish his divine purposes here on earth. For example, in Exodus chapter 9, God allowed an infectious skin disease to sweep across the nation of Egypt. It was the fourth plague. It was epidemic in nature, and God used it to fulfill his divine purposes. When King David sinned against Israel, the Lord sent an epidemic. Here's what we read. The Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time, and 70,000 men, think about that, lost their lives in this pandemic. And then here's where prophecy comes in. In the Gospels, Jesus tells us in the last days, there will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences, that's the word for pandemics, in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Jesus makes it very clear that the purpose of these terrible pestilences or pandemics will be to shake people and awaken them to the truth that Jesus Christ is going to return. And then in the book of Revelation, the words pestilence and plague, they're used all over the book. They're, they're used at least 12 different times. John writes, these have power to strike the earth with all plagues. John is saying here that there will be evil forces at work in our world that will have the power to start plagues and create pandemics. And I believe that this verse is a foreshadowing of what is happening in our world today. So prior to the second coming of Christ, this world is going to be a bad place because it will be suffering from a devastating period of divine judgment because of our sin. Bible scholars call this time the Great Tribulation. So what does that mean for us and how should we respond? During the last week of Jesus' life here on earth, one day he and his disciples left the temple in Jerusalem and hiked down the Kidron Valley and then climbed to the top of the Mount of Olives. And this is where Jesus' disciples asked him about the last days. And Jesus gave them 
a very detailed teaching about the things that will happen at the end of time. And Jesus' words are recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So prophecy has an important place in the teaching of Jesus. Here's how Matthew records it. Now, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when all these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, and here's the word, pestilences, pandemics, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So this is an important piece of prophecy because these are words that Jesus spoke. And Jesus here in Matthew chapter 24, he gives us some clear signs and events that we need to look for because they point to his second coming. Or as Jesus puts it, look here on the screen, the sign of the son of man. Here are six things Jesus said would happen as his second coming begins to draw near. First, there would be deception by false Christ. Write that down. We see this happening in greater measure today than ever before. Church, I want us to be smart about this. Any time that people believe that there is another way to God other than Jesus, they are being deceived. Jesus prophesied 2,000 years ago that this would happen before he returned, and it is happening. Number two, there would be disputes and warfare among nations. Currently, Wikipedia lists around 40 ongoing wars and conflicts taking place in our world, which is very normal. But here's what's interesting to me. Civil unrest and global unrest has tripled in the last decade due to the polarization of ideologies in our world. And some believe that this will lead to war. Number three, there would be disease and famine worldwide. This might be the prophecy that has asked, that has caused people to ask the question, is COVID-19 maybe a sign of the end of time? We really cannot answer that. It might be, it might not be. But COVID has shown us this. It has shown us that a pandemic can certainly affect our entire globalized world. Here's an interesting fact that I was not aware of. In the last year, world hunger is on the rise and it affects 9.9, .9, almost 10% of our world. So there is increased famine happening in our world today. I was not aware of that. Number four, there would be, there would be deliverance of believers. Write that down. Here's what Jesus says in verses 27 and 30 and 31 of Matthew chapter 24. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. The main point here, this right there, that's a 15 Sunday series. We're not going to do that today. The main point here is that Jesus will come again. He promised us he would, and he will deliver us from the sin and evil and darkness of this world. Number five, there would be defection of false believers. Jesus said, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Now, church, you hear me talk about this all the time because it's one of the things that makes my heart very heavy. One of the signs of the last days is that people that we thought were believers, they will choose to walk away from God. Jesus prophesied that it would happen. And guess what, church? It is happening 
Number six, to me, this is the most amazing one. There would be the declaration of the gospel to the whole world. Write that down. Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. This is absolutely amazing, church, because Jesus made this prophecy 2,000 years ago. Now, put your thinking caps on. The gospel message never should have made its way out of the first century. It really shouldn't have. But here we are. It's 2022, and because of the truth of the gospel message and because of modern technology, 80% of our world has heard the good news of the gospel, and the gospel is spreading more rapidly than it ever has before. To me, that is amazing. So here's why we need to talk about these prophetic statements that Jesus made. Jesus says to us, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, the tree's about to bloom, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, these six things that we've just talked about, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Jesus is saying to us, church, that the generation that sees with their own eyes these six things that we've just talked about, they will also see the second coming of Christ. That's what Jesus said. Now, let me just do a sidebar. I don't know if we are seeing these signs to the degree that Jesus describes them. I don't know that. But I do know that when we see these signs and they begin to manifest themselves to the degree that Jesus said they would, he says that they will fulfill themselves within a generation. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, Harv, if the church is going to be delivered and they're going to more than likely already be gone, why do we even care how or why this happens? Here's why. Write this down. I love this statement. Future events always cast their shadows before they take place. That's so important, church. Future events always cast their shadows before they take place. You know those moments in your life where you go, ah, oh, man, I should have seen that coming. I, there, there were hints all along the way. I should have known that that was going to happen. Church, Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 is trying to help us be proactive by giving us this prophetic message. And that's why we're doing this series. Tuesday night in prayer group, by the way, uh, we would invite you to prayer group on Tuesday night. We have a wonderful time, 6.15. Mindy Hughes, our prayer leader, asked this question. What lessons have you learned from COVID? Now, church, think about the scripture that we've just read in light of COVID. Jesus said when you experience these things like pandemic and famine and people walking away from their faith and being deceived, he says, it doesn't mean that the end is here, but it does mean, look up here on the screen, all these things are the beginning of birth pains. When a woman goes into labor, we know fairly soon she's going to have a baby. That is the analogy here. So I would say to you, COVID might be a shadow of things to come. But in the meantime, we all have a lot of living to do, right? Jesus says that we are to occupy until he comes. So let me ask you again, what lessons have you learned through this pandemic? Write this down. We've learned about the vulnerability of the world. On January 11th, 2020, the first COVID death was reported in Wuhan, China. Two months later, the World Health Organization declared it a global pandemic. The stock market crashed, restaurants and movie theaters emptied out, and hospitals filled to the max, and our world came screeching to a halt. 
in this pandemic showed us that we are all a little bit more vulnerable than we would like to think. I've lost several family members much younger than me. So it's shown us our vulnerability. Another lesson COVID has taught us is the credibility of God's word. Write that down. I mentioned this last week. Sometimes when you and I read the book of Revelation or Daniel, our tendency is to say, this sounds like science fiction. But church, this pandemic has helped us to see the relevance of the apocalyptic events described in God's word. And the message that the prophets in the Bible have given us that sometimes seem a bit far-fetched, today they seem more like a reporter who was telling us the truth of what we need to know and what we need to do, right? When, we, when I used to read Revelation, and I would read this verse that says, a third of mankind was killed by the plagues, I would think to myself, well, how is that going to happen? Today, it's like, hmm, I can see that happening. In short, the event of Revelation no longer seems implausible. It seems more like impending events that will one day happen. Another lesson we've learned is the uncertainty of life. Edie and I joke all the time that God knew what he was doing when he helped Kinsey get married before COVID hit because she was 23 and in love and ready to get married. And uh, many times we say to her, do you know how God orchestrated your wedding? You are so blessed that you got married when you did. I don't know how much longer we could have handled her at home. <laughs> Just kidding, Kenzie, in case you're watching. <laughs> Love you. <ya. laughs> But it is, isn't it true for all of us, this pandemic kind of turned our lives upside down. It turned our schedules upside down, shut our kids out of the classroom, caused us to have to cancel our vacation plans. Craig and Janie have canceled vacation plans about 27 times in the last three, two years. People have had to turn their kitchen tables into workspaces. People lost their jobs. Businesses failed and churches closed down, not just temporarily. Many churches have closed down forever because of this pandemic. So we've all certainly learned a lot during COVID. But here's one thing that we've learned. Would you read this with me? We can experience the certainty of God in uncertain times. Let's say that again. We can experience the certainty of God in uncertain times. And God's word tells us how we can do that. Listen to this verse. You ready? We're going to be convicted right from the get-go. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we've learned that our world is vulnerable. We've been reminded of the credibility of God's word. We have certainly experienced the uncertainty of life, and we have learned to lean into the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Write that down. We have learned to lean into the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Right before Jesus was betrayed and arrested, he spoke these words to his disciples. I think it hit me for the very first time that Jesus said these words just about two or three days before he went to the cross. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Notice Jesus didn't say, in this world, you will have trouble, and I have overcome trouble. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. Now let's think about that, because this is amazing. Jesus doesn't just overcome the event. He overcomes the environment in which the event takes place. Now, that should have got a, a big amen. Amen. In retrospect, let me say it again and write this down. Jesus doesn't just overcome the event. He overcomes the environment in which the event takes place. And we amen. Thank you. You got it that time. 
This is an important lesson that we've learned in this pandemic. Jesus doesn't just overcome trouble and pandemics. He overcomes the world in which trouble and pandemics take place in. He takes care of the whole enchilada, as they say. So we've learned some very important lessons in this pandemic, haven't we? My challenge for us today is to continue these habits as we move forward in life because nothing is wasted with God, right? So where do we go from here? How do we take these lessons that we've learned and turn them into habits, lifelong habits? Most of us have prayed more during this pandemic than we've ever prayed before. So I want to challenge us to a deeper level of prayer. I want to challenge us to pray biblical prayers. Church, it isn't surprising we've prayed more during this time because problems cause us to pray. Now, I'm 63 years old. I grew up with parents that if I was bad, they would spank me. I got spankings every day. I was a tough kid. I'll never forget being in church once, and yes, we would even get spankings in church. I'll never forget being in church, and I was there with one of my cousins. His name was Gary, and he was acting up in church. His dad is like a big old cowboy. He grabbed him, threw him up over his shoulder, and walked him out the, down the aisle, out the back door. Gary knew he was in trouble. Do you know what he did? As he was going out the door, he called out to the church. He said, y'all pray for me. <laughs> Never forget that. <laughs> Problems cause us to pray, don't they? The question I want us to ask is, what kind of prayers have we been praying? Look at this desperate prayer from a desperate king. His name was Jehoshaphat. He was facing a scenario where multiple armies were marching toward him, and in desperation, he cries out to God. Listen to his prayer. He prays, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand in your presence and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. That sounds like a good prayer for today, isn't it? He says, we have no power against this multitude. Haven't we felt that way in this pandemic? We have no power against this pandemic. He says, I have no power against this multitude that is coming against me, nor do we know what to do. Say the next six words with me. But our eyes are upon you. Whew, that's a good prayer. Church, we need to appeal to God's character in prayer. He is our only source of hope and our only place of help. We need to confess our inability to God and pray. That's hard for us, isn't it? But church, it's important for us to say to God, you know, I just can't see a way through this. I don't know which way to go or where to turn. I am helpless without you. And we also need to intentionally put our eyes on Jesus in prayer. The Bible says, I love this verse, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. This pandemic has caused us to pray but I want to challenge us to take our prayers to the next level by praying biblical prayers. Number two, I want to challenge us to sacrificially serve others. Write that down. Sacrificially serve others. Church, it's really this simple. We are most like Jesus when we serve. Teenagers, if you would say, I just want to be more like Jesus, find a place to serve because we are most like Jesus when we serve. After Jesus washed his disciples' feet, he said to them, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Cross point, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for sacrificially service of others during this pandemic. I really do believe, first of all, God is blessing this church. He really is. And I truly believe that one of the reasons why God is blessing our church and why we are doing so well in this time is because we have prayed and cried out to God and we've taken the time and effort to sacrificially serve one another and serve people who are hurting. Amen? 
How many of you know that one of the best things that we can do when we are under pressure is to quit thinking about ourselves and start thinking about other people? That does more for us than anything else. Think about this. Right before Jesus went to the cross, he didn't withdraw from his disciples and start feeling sorry for himself. Think about this. This blows my mind every time I think about it. We talked about it in men's Bible study. He sacrificially served others. He washed Judas's feet just a few days before he went to the cross. Church, he has invited us to that attitude. He has invited us to do the same thing. This pandemic has taught us to sacrificially serve, and we need to continue this habit. Amen? Amen? I want to challenge us to count our blessings. I have a new favorite song. I've been starting every morning with it. It's called Gratitude. The words go like this. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs, as I often do, but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands, and I praise you again and again. Because all I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I have nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. The person who knew Jesus the best wrote these words about him. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. And then Paul writes these words, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And then Paul tells us that we need to count our blessings regardless of our circumstances. He writes, give thanks in how many circumstances? All circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This pandemic has challenged us to count our blessings. We need to continue this habit, amen? Number four, we need to stay calm and carry on. I'm preaching to myself here. I tend to operate at a pretty high level as far as a... (laughs) We need to stay calm and carry on. Church, this action flows out of counting our blessings. When we count our blessings, we begin to gain a quiet confidence in the Lord in the middle of all that is happening. Write this down. Confidence in God creates a calm spirit. Let me ask you a question. When you get beside yourself, who are you thinking about yourself or God, right? When you get beside yourself, what are you thinking about your problems or God, right? Developing God confidence develops a calm spirit. I love that. Here's the secret. God did not give you, my friend, a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. You know, we have experienced a lot of fear over the last two years, and it's because this pandemic brought a spirit of fear with it, which means that we as believers need to respond to it in the spirit. Look at these verses. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. This isn't just a physical thing, it's spiritual. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world, On the contrary, they have what kind of power? Divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we do what? Take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You know what this verse is telling us? It's saying, don't let negative thoughts control your mind. Don't let negative thoughts control your mind. Take them captive. Rob, uh, Rob Taylor, dad, his name was Bob Taylor. He used to call it stinking thinking. Everybody say stinking thinking. Stinking thinking. When we have stinking thinking, we need to stop and say to ourselves, hey, I'm in charge of my mind. You see, our minds are like airports and our thoughts are like airplanes flying over. We can either let those thoughts land or we can tell them to just keep on going. And a lot of times that's what we need to do. This pandemic has taught us to take captive our thoughts. We need to continue this habit as we move forward, amen? 
And then we need to do the next right thing. Write that down. We need to do the next right thing. Our tendency is to want to know everything that is going to happen in the future, but this pandemic has taught us that sometimes we have to set aside our long-term goals and just take one day at a time and just do the next right thing. Jesus' disciples were always trying to get him to give them a picture of the future. And while Jesus certainly gives them prophetic words in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus also said to them, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I mean, we could all say amen to that, right? This pandemic has taught us to say, okay, God, what do you want me to do today? What's next? And when God shows us what we should do next, we do it. And then we say, okay, God, what is next? What is the next right thing to do? Church, we are living in uncertain times and there is so much that we cannot control. So one of the habits we need to develop is the habit of asking God to just help us do the next right thing. And I submit to you, this is why prophecy is so important. Because church, there is coming a day when all of these things that Jesus predicted would happen, will happen. Is this pandemic a part of it? I have no idea. But I do believe that this pandemic was meant to teach us some things because God never wastes anything. And we have learned some valuable lessons through COVID. And we need to continue to carry these lessons into the next chapter of our life and live out the spiritual habits that God has worked into our lives in this time. Amen? We are not helpless, and our world is not hopeless. Even as the world collapses, the Lord is building his church. You are a part of that. We can say something, do something, pray something, preach something, and live by the convictions of Christ. Let's pray together. We are keenly aware of your presence here this morning, Lord God. We sense you speaking to us and we are grateful. We are grateful. <laughs> Our hearts are filled with gratitude. We just say hallelujah to you, Jesus, King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, thank you for clear prophetic words that Jesus spoke to us in Matthew 24. May we take the time to study and understand his words. Lord, would you take the lessons we've learned in this time, and we're still kind of in it, but take the lessons that we are learning and help us to continue to move forward with these life lessons. Help us to take time to pray, help us to take our prayer life to the next level, help us to sacrificially serve others, help us to count our blessings, help us to stay calm and carry on, and help us to do the next right thing. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great week.